Over the last 30 years, there have been thousands of reported sightings of unidentified flying objects over the British Isles. You think I'm bloody daft, but this is a UFO. In the summer of 2008, reports of flying saucers and other crafts were capturing the headlines again. Over the years, numerous eyewitnesses, including military personnel, police officers and experienced airline pilots have testified to seeing strange lights in the sky and other mysterious phenomena. Very bright yellow object. It was uh, nothing like an airplane that I'd ever seen before. It's the brightest light I've ever seen in my life. Many of these UFO sightings remain unexplained to this day. But what or who were they? Could they really be evidence of extraterrestrial life? It's a strange, small red light. Weird. It's coming this way. It's definitely coming this way. It was just something out of uh, a science fiction film. It was totally unbelievable. Tonight, we hear firsthand from those who witnessed them and examine the truth behind some of Britain's most celebrated UFO sightings. In 1977, Broadhaven in West Wales became notorious as a UFO hotspot. There have been a number of calls to the police station. Every call referred to objects in the sky. Dozens of witnesses claimed to have seen mysterious lights and objects around the village. It was an orange object, which seemed to be split into well, several, was, one, one or two segments. Yeah. The number of sightings left locals shocked. What on earth was that? Experts baffled. We could offer no explanation. And even sparked a Ministry of Defence investigation. The Ministry don't tend to do investigations of UFO sightings. It's extremely unusual. The phenomenon would become known as the Broadhaven Triangle. In February 1977, Nine-year-old David Davis was playing with his friends when they noticed something strange in a field behind their school. A silver cigar-shaped object um, about the size of a bus popped up from behind some trees as if it was trying to take off. I don't know whether it was stuck, but it seemed to pause for about two or three seconds and then disappear back behind the trees again. It was only, only a matter of seconds that I actually saw the object, but it, it imprinted itself on my memory forever. The children ran back inside and alerted their teachers. Ralph Llewellyn, uh, who was the headmaster of Broadhaven School at the time, he got us all together and in exam situations, he got us to draw what we'd seen and describe it as well. At the time of the sighting, Hugh Turnbull was chief reporter for local paper, The Western Telegraph. I had a call to say that the children at Broadhaven School had seen something remarkable. They didn't actually say they'd seen aliens, they didn't say they'd seen this thing hovering overhead. They'd seen something inexplicable. Hugh drove down to the school to interview the group of children who were aged between 9 and 11 years old. He wasn't anticipating what they were about to tell him. I spoke to the head teacher, Ralph Llewellyn, and he showed me some of the drawings that uh, the children had done. And it was evident that there was some similarity between the drawings. Some were a bit far out. Some showed alien figures, some didn't. But in general, they were showing the same sort of object, the same shape of object. And uh, having those pictures made it obviously a very much more exciting story. Initially skeptical about the story, Hugh decided to retrace the children's steps. 
He asked one of them, David Davis, to take him back to the place where the object had been seen. I took a look around the field. We were looking really for any sign that an object had been there, be it from this, uh, this planet or another planet. There were no car tires or, or tracks or anything, but a telegraph pole cross member had been dislodged and was now sort of sitting at 45 degrees. Their journey took them past the gates of the local sewage works, which lay directly behind the field where the sighting had occurred. Liz Philpot, an administrator at the school at the time, had her own theory as to what the children might have seen. Later in the afternoon, we walked down the lane to the sewerage depot, and there are big wrought iron gates there, so we rattled on those until someone came out, and it was the man in charge. And I asked him, in confidence, to tell me whether or not um, his men had driven a tanker down into the, the field. And he said, absolutely not. No way could we get down there. I think these children, whatever they saw, it was something unusual. And a sewage tanker, I don't think, would have fitted into that category. Also, it would have been a very difficult uh, place to get a sewage tanker into because it was steep. I think the, the, the weather had been wet, so there would have been signs of tire tracks. Many of us came from farming backgrounds. Um, so we knew it wasn't anything agricultural. Persuaded by the children's testimony, Hugh decided to run the story. I think I recognised immediately that this was a, a much bigger story than we'd had previously about uh, UFOs. I don't think I realised how the story would take off and it would become a major international news event in the way that it did. In the winter of 1977, a group of children in Wales claimed to have seen a spacecraft hovering behind their school playing field. When the story hit the newsstands, Broadhaven, a small seaside village with only 600 residents, suddenly found itself the focus of intense public interest. An investigation has begun into a claim that something strange came out of the skies and landed in the Welsh village of Broadhaven near Haverford West. Whatever it was, it was spotted by children from the local school. We just couldn't carry on normal lessons. The, the phone was going off every, every couple of minutes. We were even getting researchers and interviewers from as far afield as Australia, New Zealand, America, all wanting to talk to the people who'd seen the flying saucer. The incident at Broadhaven Primary School appeared to be a baffling one-off event. Until reports of other strange sightings began to surface. Five miles from Broadhaven in the village of Herbranston, Maureen Deiter also witnessed something for which she had no rational explanation. I was out one day during the week having a bit of fresh air at night and I happened to look up in the sky and I saw this cylindrical object with lights on it and it was going very fast. So it was only a question of really seconds that I actually saw it. And I thought, what's that? I couldn't believe my eyes. The village of Littlehaven lies one mile down the coast from Broadhaven. Local resident Dorothy Cale was setting off from home one evening when she too observed something strange. We went out from our house, which was on the cliff top at Littlehaven, and there were, there were some flashes, very, very bright flashes, which lit up the whole village. All of a sudden, there was a, a very strong light. The driver put her foot hard on the brake quickly. 
there was the brightest light I've ever seen in my life and it appeared to be inside a glass dome. Well, it took our breath away, really. We, we, we all of us looked at it. Nobody said a word. This was a strange thing. None of us said a word. And then all of a sudden, it, we didn't see it lift up or go anywhere. It was just gone. It, it flashed and it was gone. And our driver said, what on earth was that? The light resembled nothing Dorothy had ever seen before. But astronomer Ian Ridpath has been investigating UFO sightings for over 20 years. He believes there's usually a very straightforward explanation for such strange lights in the sky. People in general don't know the sky very well, the night sky, and people can very easily be fooled by the sight of a bright star or planet, particularly when it's low down and particularly when it's twinkling. And at night, there is really no way to estimate the size and distance of an object and uh, people can think that something is actually much closer to them than really it is. Whatever the cause, the sightings in the area continued. Like the incident at the primary school, some involved more than one eyewitness. Stephen Bamford and Robert Best were returning home to Broadhaven after a night out when they noticed something unusual out at sea. We probably saw the people before we saw the object. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we wondered what they were all looking at. Yeah. We assumed it was probably the cliff was on fire. It did look like a fire, but it was obviously out to sea and it moved from right to left. It was an orange, an orange object which seemed to be split into well, several... One, one or two segments. Yeah. And then we thought we'd be brave and drive out there or drive in the general direction to see if we could sort of find whatever it was. And then as it moved across, or they moved across, they just shrunk and disappeared. Diminished on itself. Yeah. The men could think of no obvious explanation for what they'd seen. So I thought it might have been a harvest moon or something at first. I thought, you don't get a harvest moon at half past one in the morning. If it had been a ship or something like that, it, it couldn't have been in front of the cliffs at one moment and behind the cliffs at the next. Mm. So it was... It, it was a very strange anomaly, and that's, that's why everybody was stood out here watching it. Psychologist Chris French has made a study of the reliability of such eyewitness testimony. Now, in situations where we've actually got evidence from multiple witnesses, and that evidence seems to be telling pretty much the same story, everybody is saying the same thing, then we're quite likely to give that kind of evidence much more weight than single, uncorroborated testimony. But one thing we should bear in mind is that when people see something unusual, such as a possible UFO sighting, then they will actually discuss what they've seen with each other. And we've got lots of good experimental evidence to show that one person's account of what they've seen can actually influence another. But with the sightings continuing to flood in, many were convinced that something strange was happening in Broadhaven. By now the police were being drawn into the mystery. There have been a number of calls to the police station. Every call referred to objects in the sky and always some distance away, uh, travelling in a particular direction and then just disappearing into thin air. People were ringing in and writing letters all the time. Um, the ones that I was more convinced about were the ones who said, well, I'd rather you didn't use my name, but I saw this. It was really the start of what they call the Broadhaven Triangle. They call it the Broadhaven Triangle, an area here in Pembrokeshire where sensible, down-to-earth people are constantly seeing strange objects in the sky, mysterious lights. It's an area where an entire classroom of schoolchildren saw from their playground a UFO. The triangle encompassed the southeast of St Brides Bay, through Broadhaven, down to Milford Haven, and towards Haverford West inland. It was an area of coastline which changed dramatically from mile to mile. Could the area's local geography have been a factor in the sightings? There's a number of oil refineries and other industries around Milford Haven. Flares at night and uh, odd-shaped 
plant, but people around here would have been very familiar with that. Those have been there for many years before anybody started seeing UFOs. The number of sightings reported in the area meant that what had begun as an intriguing local story was turning into a much bigger phenomenon. It was what UFO researchers like Dr. David Clark call a flap. The word flap became associated with periods of intense UFO activity concentrated in certain areas from the mid-50s onwards. So it's a, it's, an, it's a word that becomes part of ufology from that point onwards. Now the first real flap that seems to have occurred in, uh, in the UK was the one at Warminster in the 1960s. For 10 years, the town of Warminster in Wiltshire was famous for being a UFO hotspot. Unlike the Broadhaven sightings, the flap in Warminster began on Christmas Day 1964 with a mysterious sound. People were reporting hammering noises, things shaking the roofs of their houses, uh, machinery type noises going overhead. And when they came out and had a look, nothing was wrong. By May 1965, reports of lights in the sky had begun to surface. Local journalist Arthur Shuttlewood connected the lights and sounds, and the Warminster thing was born. He was writing for the local newspaper, and he got more and more obsessed with this and went out sky watching himself. The more he wrote about it, the more the story became part of the local legend and lots of other people then started saying they'd seen things. It was the sheer number of sightings that made Warminster unique. We are stood here on Cradle Hill, which was the main sky watching location. Um, and every weekend, every Saturday throughout the 60s and the 70s, there could be up to 50 or 60 people up here observing and watching for the thing. Kevin Goodman was one of those who took to the hills, travelling to Warminster to investigate the phenomenon. It was very much a communal thing. It was like-minded individuals searching, looking for something, wanting to be part of something. After several months, Kevin witnessed something himself. Over in that direction, from over by the golf club, came four red lights, equally distant, spaced apart. They carried on travelling through, around and over to Battlesbury Hill, which is over here. They stayed in the line for approximately about two or three minutes, and the lead object then shot upwards at a tremendous rate of speed, performed a flawless 90-degree turn without stopping, and shot out of sight. And about 30 seconds later, the following three lights then just shot straight up into the sky. To this day, I can't really rationally explain what I saw. The sky watchers were identifying hundreds of UFOs in the hills. But how reliable were their reports? One of the important things about Warminster um, is that it is surrounded by various military bases and camps. There's an artillery school there. There are various tank training areas around there and around Salisbury Plain. The area was one used to military activity. Covering 150 square miles, Salisbury Plain was the largest military training area in the UK. And that wasn't all. 18 miles from Warminster, an experimental establishment conducted trials of prototype military aircraft. The ufologists would say that the reason that you get so many sightings near military bases is because the extraterrestrials are very interested in what's going on at those bases. Whereas it seems far more plausible to argue that what's happening is that it's the activity at the bases themselves. Like Warminster, Broadhaven was also surrounded by military bases. Close to the village was RAF Broadie, a base for search and rescue helicopters and a training station for military pilots. Could it have been that it was simply RAF activity that was responsible for the Broadhaven sightings?
Well, Broadly at the time was a very, very busy base. It uh, had aircraft taking off and landing as frequently as Heathrow Airport at some times of the day. So there's an awful lot of activity going on there. As RAF Broadie's community relations officer at the time, squadron leader Tony Cowan found himself fielding calls from anxious locals who'd seen things around Broadhaven they couldn't explain. We've had a look at the flying programme, which was uh, easily accessed, and see if we could uh, relate the time of the incident or the reporting to the time of activity that was taking place at our airfield or indeed in our area. Sometimes the answer was obvious. Apart from the, the training of the, the jet pilots, there would have been exercises involving our local search and rescue helicopter unit, uh, the local lifeboat stations and the Coast Guard as well. I can remember at least on one occasion, it was quite a big exercise involving all those people plus a Nimrod patrol aircraft to carry out a search. And it did take place at night and the Nimrod was dropping flares to illuminate the area so that the lifeboat could spot the target. But Dorothy Kale, who'd witnessed strange lights near her home in Littlehaven, wasn't convinced this was the explanation. We could see Broadie Airfield quite clearly, so we were very well used to seeing all sorts of lights and flares and things like that. It was nothing like anything we had seen out to sea or across the airfield. And RAF flight records didn't always prove conclusive. On some occasions we were able to explain by uh, relating the time and the date to known air activity. Uh, on other occasions we could offer no explanation. I think to the people that, uh, that saw something, they, they will always remain a mystery. <laughs> RAF engineer Gordon Bowden was stationed at Broadley in the late 1970s. Years of experience had taught him that military activity could often be misidentified. Helicopter beams, searchlight patterns can appear very strange depending on the, um, the compass direction that the helicopter is operating from and the search pattern that the helicopter is conducting. And to the untrained eye you'll get a visual which will look like a ball of light and then, if it moves a different pattern, you'll get the beam. But not all the UFO sightings around Broadhaven were witnessed by untrained civilians. Gordon also witnessed them himself. On two occasions at Broadhaven, I did see strange lights out at sea. These lights that I saw accelerated with such phenomenal speed. I, I cannot explain what they were, but my military training would have said we had no aircraft at that time that could have travelled that fast and changed direction so quickly could, because it would have killed the pilots. If flight activity at the RAF base couldn't explain all the Broadhaven sightings, then what could? Broadie was not the only military establishment in West Wales. Less than 500 metres away lay a secret facility. It was run by the United States. US military bases have been connected to some of the most celebrated and well-documented UFO incidents in Britain. Yeah, it's a strange, small red light. Weird. It's coming this way. It is definitely coming this way. Could these American bases provide any clues to what was being witnessed on British soil? In 1977, the village of Broadhaven in Wales became infamous for a series of supposed UFO sightings. Why were so many people reporting mysterious lights and objects in the area? With the RAF and local police unable to explain all the sightings, attention turned to the secret US base that lay 10 miles from the village. A seemingly innocent research establishment, the base became the focus of local speculation. 
It was a top secret establishment and those people that um, that worked within the facility were, were very strict with their security codes. They were very hush-hush about what was going on there and if you rang them up, somebody would say, US Navy Brody, this is not a secure line. Why were they worried about secure lines if it was just an oceanographic research establishment? It wasn't the first time on British soil that there had been strange phenomena sighted around a US military base. On two occasions, US air bases in Suffolk had been at the center of supposed UFO activity. The first sighting took place in August 1956, when radar personnel at US Air Force bases Bentwaters and Lakenheath observed something strange on their screens. The Lake and Heath incident caused all kinds of um, concern on both sides of the Atlantic. The Americans alerted the, uh, the Royal Air Force. The radar station at uh, RAF Neatishead uh, began tracking these same mysterious objects. And it led to a very, very bizarre evening in which waves of RAF fighters were scrambled to go and look at this thing over Lake and Heath. Two aircraft gave chase, but failed to intercept or identify the object. Running low on fuel, they returned to base and the object disappeared from radar screens. The Lake and Heath case had never been fully explained and it's, it was the first of a whole series involving uh, military establishments in the East Anglian region. Nothing else significant was reported in the area for 25 years, until the night of December the 26th, 1980. Local garage owner Jerry Harris lived next to the joint US Air Force bases of Woodbridge and Bentwaters. He was returning home when he noticed some peculiar lights above him. My wife told me to they're helicopters. So I said, no, they're not. I said, because they're helicopters, they're going to crash into the trees. The lights were hovering above Rendlesham Forest, which lay between the bases. What no one realised at the time was that this was to become one of the UK's most iconic UFO encounters. And they kept moving about, they went sort of down, downwards and then disappeared. All of a sudden this uh, thing came out of the trees, when it got to the top of the trees it took off and uh, flew up into the sky straight as an arrow and uh, disappeared out of sight and I couldn't see it anymore. Jerry decided to investigate the mysterious lights. I went round in my van to uh, ha have a look and I was stopped from going into the forest uh, by uh, an English policeman and a military policeman, they're both together. And they said I couldn't go through the forest. Um, so I had to turn around and come back. Jerry put the sighting out of his mind, and the Rendlesham incident seemed forgotten. Then, two years later, the story resurfaced, after an anonymous tip-off to a national newspaper. It was in 1983 that the story first broke and became headline news. The news of the world got hold of this story and put it on the front page. A UFO lands in Suffolk, and that's official. This blew the story wide open. Nick Pope used to run the British government's UFO desk at the Ministry of Defence and has investigated the Rendlesham Forest incident. With Rendlesham, what you had was a report uh, from the deputy base commander of uh, one of NATO's most important military establishments. And here he was saying not only had some of his personnel witnessed a UFO, but he'd seen it too. Colonel Holt is probably the most senior military officer ever to have gone on the record with a first-person written account of a personal UFO sighting. With the story now out in the open, an extraordinary piece of evidence was released by an officer from the Woodbridge base. A tape recording of Colonel Holt's investigation. Colonel Holt took a small team of men out into the forest to investigate and he recorded his observations as he went out into the forest. Did you saw a light right there, right there, right there. Right there. Where? Through the head off left, right there. 
got it. Oh, there it is. Hey, I see it too. What is it? We don't know, sir. So, yeah, can I get some more? Yeah, it's a strange, small red light. Weird. It's coming this way. Awesome. It is definitely coming this way. Pieces of the screen off. There is no doubt about it. This is weird. You can hear the, the tension in Colonel Holt's voice. Uh, you can hear the tension actually in all of Holt's team. Okay, we're looking at the thing, it looks like an eye winking at you. It, it sort of has a hollow center, a dark, dark center. It's, it's you know, like a pupil of an eye looking at you and winking. This is unreal. We're turning around and heading back toward the, the base. These are not people who mistake aircraft lights for, for something more exotic. When these people say um, and go on the record uh, as saying, we experienced something above and beyond uh, anything we've ever seen before, you can take that to the bank. A UFO sighting made by several credible military witnesses made the Rendlesham story unique. Astronomer Ian Ridpath has investigated a number of UFO cases and was keen to get to the bottom of the airman sighting. When the Rendlesham Forest case hit the headlines in 1983, uh, I realised that I actually had to take this case seriously because it had um, you know, good, apparently very good evidence. But conversations with locals soon convinced him that the Rendlesham case was not all it at first appeared. From the position in the forest where they saw their flashing UFO, you can actually see straight to the Orford Nest lighthouse, which appears to hover between the trees, not very far off the ground. And as you move towards it, between the trees, the light seems to recede in front of you, uh, which is exactly the effect that the airman reported as they moved towards this flashing light, but they never actually got to it because it, it got further and further away. I've been to Rendlesham Forest at night, and anyone who's been to Rendlesham Forest at night uh, and has seen the lighthouse will, will realise that it's a tiny pinprick of light in, in the distant horizon. There's no way that Holt and his team could have misidentified that for something more spectacular. Jerry Harris and the US Airmen had reported that the lights in the forest had moved in strange directions. But this too could have had a rational explanation. I knew from experience that bright meteors or fireballs, which are natural pieces of debris from space burning up in the atmosphere, can give the impression that something has come down quite nearby. I was able to find from the British Astronomical Association that indeed a bright fireball had been seen at that same time that the men had seen something apparently descending into the forest. Ian Ridpath's evidence suggested that the UFO was nothing more than a combination of unusual but naturally occurring phenomena. It appears to be an absolutely uh, superb, almost inexplicable case, but when you look at each of those aspects individually, there is a rational explanation for each of them. But this conclusion didn't satisfy everyone. If the lights did have a rational explanation, why were the Americans so reluctant to discuss it? All the Americans I knew from the base, and none of them would talk about it at all. They weren't allowed. And they had strict instructions from up above not to talk about it. So I couldn't find out anything from them whatsoever. They would just try to cover it up. When a wave of UFO sightings had hit Broadhaven in West Wales in 1977, attention had also turned to the US military. Not far from the village lay a secret US base. When strange lights and objects were reported in the area, speculation grew that the Americans were developing secret, state-of-the-art military technology. Nobody really knew what was going on there, so I think it's quite a possibility that all this could be linked to some sort of military activity. But when the base was deactivated in 1995, the truth about the Americans' activities was finally revealed. As it turns out, they were, they were listening for, for Russian submarines at the height of the Cold War. Far from developing prototype weaponry, 
the mysterious building had housed nothing more than banks of computers and monitoring equipment. This revelation put paid to the theory that the mysterious lights in Broadhaven had come from the secret US base. But the sightings were about to take a bizarre new turn, with accounts of more than just unexplained lights in the sky. Two months after the first sightings, dozens of eyewitnesses reported seeing strange silver figures around the village. Police officer Ernest Jones personally investigated one of the sightings. A call came into the control room there, and I happened to be in the station. Um, a report of a sighting of a silvery figure quite close to a dwelling. The call had come from the Coombs family, who lived on Ripperston Farm, a few miles from Broadhaven. Although the Coombs no longer wish to talk about the night's events, Ernest Jones remembers them well. So here I was going to a farm on a dark night, in the middle of the night, not knowing exactly what to expect, but expecting to get close to something that nobody knew nothing about. So a few things were going through my mind. We arrived in the yard, went to the front door, doors open, we went in. There's a family there, established her husband and wife, spoke with the wife, she was very, very frightened. Got over right, she saw a silvery figure moving about very close to the window. Her husband, he, he turned round and saw this figure very close by the window outside. Would he been sitting? He was really frightened as well. And we're not talking here of a softy man working nine till five in an office. We're talking of a man and quite used to going out of the house all times of day and night, checking on cattle. No way would he come out of the house with us. No way. So we went out, we had a look around the house. On the back, um, the garden, the fields nearby, the cattle pens, check the machinery. With the silver figure nowhere to be seen, PC Jones returned to the house and made arrangements to evacuate the family. From the condition they were in that night, especially Mrs. Coombs, she didn't feel safe and she didn't feel that the, the house was safe for the family. The Ripperston farm incident was not an isolated one-off. Reported sightings of strange silver figures were taking place all over the area. With the mystery deepening, the investigation would now step up to a new level. The MOD branch, which was responsible for UFOs, they had received um, quite a few um, letters from members of the public and they'd seen all the, 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 the lurid um, press coverage of the Welsh Triangle. And there is a, there's one particular memo from the, the head of the, the MOD UFO branch to the RAF police. There's a lot of concern in West Wales. Something's obviously been seen. Some of these witnesses are quite level-headed, reliable people. Could you make some discreet inquiries? into what's been seen there. The very fact that the military were interested was very, very unusual because the ministry don't tend to do field investigations of UFO sightings. It's extremely unusual. The Broadhaven Triangle was now being taken seriously at the highest level and an MOD investigation was underway. Its conclusions would be completely unexpected. <laughs> They call it the Broadhaven Triangle. In 1977, Broadhaven in West Wales became known as a hotspot of UFO activity. Claims of lights, strange objects, and even silver figures were being made by dozens of local witnesses. Six months into the sightings, the MOD decided to launch an investigation. 
in itself an unusual occurrence and something not made public for nearly 30 years. Before the Freedom of Information Act came into force, uh, you have to remember that the default position of the Ministry of Defence, an inherently secretive organisation, was to say nothing. In 2005, the Ministry of Defence's report on this incident was finally made public. It does look as if um, some discreet inquiries as they described at the time, were made. And, the, and the, the answer that came back, which is mentioned in, in, a, in a briefing to the defence intelligence staff later in 1977, was that a practical joker was behind some of these more bizarre reports that had reached the ministry. The practical joker revealed himself to be Glyn Edwards, a local businessman from Milford Haven. We had a round table uh, dinner and the theme was a fancy dress dinner. So, um, as it was topical at the time, I decided to dress up as a spaceman. So I borrowed an industrial suit from one of our local suppliers. <laughs> I went to the dinner and before the dance had started, I went out to the car to remove it, but some of my colleagues said, let's go around the village. So we all jumped in the car. Bumped into a few people, turned a few heads, and uh, after about 10 minutes, we decided to go back. Going back then, we stopped outside the Haven Fort Hotel. I started walking up the drive in this uh, silver spacesuit, and they had the headlights of the car behind me, so I was silhouetted going up the drive of the hotel. All my colleagues were hiding in the bushes at that time, and one of them said, there's somebody in the window. I went a bit further and another one shouted, oh, she's got a gun. And I thought, right, that's it. I dived under a rhododendron bush and lost my footing and rolled all the way back down to the road. One of them said, let's do it again. I said, not so likely, if she's got a gun, I'm off. So then we went back to the hotel, changed out the suit and we just carried on with the, the dinner. With such an obvious explanation for the Little Haven sightings, why were so many people willing to believe they'd witnessed something extraterrestrial? We know that eyewitness testimony can be very, very fallible. People genuinely and sincerely believe that they've seen something that day which defies any conventional explanation, but the evidence from psychological studies would suggest that we should actually take those accounts with a pinch of salt. But the hoaxer has always denied responsibility for one sighting, at Ripperston Farm. PC Jones, who investigated the incident, has kept an open mind. I can't help thinking of, of the state they were in that night. There was something certainly out of the ordinary that frightened that family. As 1977 drew to a close, the number of UFO sightings in the area began to decline, and the unusual events were consigned to memory. Given the large number of people who saw it and the number of pretty intelligent people who came forward and said they'd seen something, I think most people think there must have been something behind it. Not necessarily flying saucers, but uh, something. Because we didn't know what it was, we just sort of ignored it and decided if we don't know what it was, we can't talk about it. And, and it just, uh, you know, that was it, it just went away really. For many who witnessed the Broadhaven phenomenon, it remains something that they find difficult to explain. I'm a very rational person and I, I, I say I don't believe in UFOs, but having seen something unusual myself, but I, I, it, seems so, it seems ridiculous to me really to think there's, there's something from outer space that's come down and settled in Little Haven. There's no physical evidence, there's no photographic evidence, and, and that's a great shame, because I think most people uh, have an open mind about the whole business, and, uh, and I think if you look into a night sky, uh, you must believe that, that there must be something else out there. Uh, what it is, I don't know. I'm absolutely sure of what I saw that day. I saw an object that was large, cigar-shaped, silver, after 30 years, I'm no nearer the understanding than I was on the day that I saw it, but I am 
100% sure that what I saw that day is as we reported it. We follow three women who decided to forgo traditional medical care and have their babies at home with no professional assistance or pain relief. Extraordinary People Next sees just how they got on. UFOs, if we do finally make contact with aliens, how will it happen? Will they arrive in fantastic spacecraft like the UFOs glimpsed recently above Mexico City? Will we pick up a faint signal from their corner of the universe? Or will we arrive too late and find the ruins of an ancient alien civilization? Making contact with aliens and UFOs, next. Even from a distance of 93 million miles, the sun is the source of all our bounty. Without its warming rays, the Earth would be a lifeless hunk of rock, orbiting silently in the vacuum of space. The ancients were well aware of the sun's importance. When the sky suddenly darkened during a solar eclipse, they thought it might be the end of the world. Eclipses are a fine example of how the ancient person responded to an unexpected astronomical phenomenon because eclipses were not predictable to the ancients. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know that it was the moon passing in front of the sun. They thought the sun was being devoured by some uh, evil god. So throughout the world, people were frightened by this. Gradually, science replaced superstition. In 1540, the Polish astronomer Nicholas Copernicus published his revolutionary theory that the Sun, not the Earth, was the center of the solar system. In the early 1600s, Galileo improved the new scientific marvel, the telescope, enough to prove the Copernican theory was fact. In modern times, the rhythms of Sun, Moon and Earth are well understood, so that a solar eclipse is the occasion for excitement rather than fear. And so it was that on July 11, 1991, families around Mexico City gathered on street corners to witness one of the longest solar eclipses of the century. They brought telescopes and video cameras, but when they looked skyward, a surprise awaited. The people were recording the eclipse when they saw UFOs in the sky. And they were able to record, at least in three different cities, exactly at the same time, the same kind of UFOs. By 1.25 p.m., the sky had darkened, temperatures dropped, and something extraordinary still appeared in the skies above Mexico City. Jaime Maussan, producer of Mexico's equivalent of 60 Minutes, played some of the UFO videos on his program. They were taken at the same time from three different cities. The tapes ignited an immediate controversy. Critics charged that the purported UFO was nothing more than the planet Venus, which became visible during the total eclipse. In late July 1991, Maussan made an on-air request for more UFO videos. His viewers formed groups known as Los Vigilantes del Cielo, the Sky Watchers. There are many dozens of these vigilantes all around the country, and that way we can survey the sky of Mexico very effectively. We have at least from 8 to 10,000 videos in Mexico. It's the largest collection ever. Probably not all of them are UFOs. Probably some of them are balloons. Some others are airplanes, but many of them, uh, probably 10 to 15 percent of them, are really good, mysterious objects, something that cannot be explained easily. The object in this video moves in reverse, stops and hovers, 
patterns of flight not associated with airplanes, birds, or weather balloons. On September 16, 1993, Mexico's Independence Day, a shimmering silver object seems to fly near a squadron of military helicopters that appeared in formation over the capital. Several UFOs have been reported near Popocatapetl, an active volcano that looms some 50 miles from Mexico City. The government keeps this camera permanently trained on the volcano, watching for eruptions. In June of 1999, it snapped this picture of a UFO. Some of the Mexico videos show large clusters of objects hovering in the sky. These formations resemble those filmed in the United States during July of 1952. However, no scientific comparison has yet been made. We have basically a mass of seemingly good evidence that has yet to be sifted through by UFO investigators. It's too soon to tell whether or not videos were taken of actual UFOs, whatever they are, or whether some of these things are just hoaxes or, you know, things showing planets or airplanes flying by. We need more research into these particular sightings. Some of the Mexican videos seem to be unexplainable at this time, but I won't go so far as to say that proves they're flying saucers. There's a difference between, uh, I don't know what it was, and oh, it's an alien spacecraft. I never jump, make that leap. It's inappropriate to make that. What were its characteristics that rule out conventional explanations, even if you don't know what it was? Of all the UFO episodes in Mexico, few caused the pervasive excitement shown in this video. The tape was made during an unprecedented multiple sighting, perhaps the most widely witnessed UFO incident in history. In January 1st, 1994, uh, Mexico City, the whole city stopped. I mean, stopped. People were driving cars and they stopped the car to look to the sky and millions saw UFOs. This was in every newscast, in the television, in the radio. It was, this news was reported in every single newspaper in Mexico City. An incredible event. An event that would demonstrate the presence of these objects, especially in this country. What is amazing for us, the Mexicans, uh, is that nobody else around the world knew what happened in Mexico. The wave of sightings, ongoing since 1991, is notable for both the astonishing number of videos it has produced and the willingness of Jaime Maussan and other journalists to treat the matter seriously. I thought about it in 1991, if I wanted to do this, if I wanted to get involved with something so controversial as UFOs. But the truth is the truth. And if you like the truth, you go behind the truth. It doesn't matter how risky it is. And as a journalist, I want to have the big scoop of all times. And this is the biggest scoop of all times. It's risky. Yes, you have to take, you have to have courage. Yes, you have. But I think it's worth it. However, according to at least one researcher, Mexico's UFOs are not the ultimate journalistic scoop, but byproducts of geological forces as old as time. UFOs have been playing hide-and-seek with Earthlings for decades. Even as we open the door to the 21st century, no one has proven where UFOs come from and just what it is they want. If cave paintings, biblical accounts, and Renaissance artworks can be taken at face value, the guessing game has actually gone on for thousands of years. But some investigators have advanced a fresh theory to explain UFOs. Simply put, they are not objects from outer space, but a whole spectrum of luminous phenomena that originate within the core of the Earth itself. 
The Earth is a massively complex laboratory. There are infinite number of forces that are interacting, and we really don't understand those as yet in, in any great depth. And uh, the Earth does produce lights. It has its light show. And I think they're older than the human race. They belong to the very body of the Earth. Among these exotic natural wonders are earthquake lights and ball lightning. Scientists believe that earthquake lights occur both before and after tremors, when gas released from within the Earth suddenly ignites and shoots sparks into the atmosphere. Ball lightning is believed to be an accumulation of static electricity that not only becomes visible, but is also capable of moving in the air and along hard surfaces. To those who have studied UFOs, however, even the most spectacular natural phenomenon can only explain a few unidentified flying objects. When you look at a range of UFO reports that have been made over the years and thousands and thousands, presumably some small fraction of them, if they're under the right conditions, um, in the right place at the right time, some of these kinds of phenomena have to be considered. But by and large, from what I've read and what I've, I've seen, um, they don't really fit. In this ongoing debate, another type of naturally occurring luminous display is often cited to explain UFOs. They are known as Earth lights. The characteristics that probably distinguish Earth lights from earthquake lights or ball lightning are that they tend to last for longer. And uh, they often haunt particular areas like a valley, like a mountain. Um, in, in China, for example, Mount Wu Tai Shan and Mount Omai, there are temples that have been built specifically because light phenomena occur there. Uh, and the people who built the temples thought this, these lights were an expression of the Dharma. Uh, but that indicates to you how long lights were seen in that area, centuries. Despite such ancient traditions, no one can explain exactly how Earth lights are created. We are testing theories. And one of the strongest contenders is that tectonic stresses in the Earth through the Earth's geology, not necessarily related actually to an earthquake, though it can be, um, that these stresses produce tremendous force fields and that through whatever mechanisms we don't really understand yet, plasmas are produced. Proponents of this naturalistic theory suggest that plasmas luminous clusters of charged particles explain even the most well-known UFO sightings. And I should also say, if we go back to uh, Kenneth Arnold's flight over the Cascade Mountains, he saw nine objects of light. And uh, at that time, uh, the Cascade Mountains, which we know are tectonically volatile, um, they uh, were building up to their largest earthquake ever recorded at that time. On April 4, 1949, Seattle, Washington crumbled under the impact of that earthquake. However, it hit more than 18 months after Kenneth Arnold's sighting. Could there have been a link? Sounds good. Yes, luminous phenomena produced by earthquakes. Yes, people see sometimes luminous phenomena around flying saucers. Fine, that doesn't make a cause and effect connection at all. Yet according to the Earth Lights theory, masses of plasma do exhibit some of the distinctive qualities of UFOs. The interesting thing about these plasmas is that at night they will shine. They will be your lights in the sky. Uh, but in daylight, a plasma can seem to reflect light and look metallic. But are qualities of reflectivity and a metallic appearance enough to equate plasmas with UFOs? If they're going to talk natural phenomenon, what is there out there that has the capability to hover and uh, then shuts off and then the object uh, zooms straight up out of sight? There's no technology like that that we know about. And there's certainly no natural phenomenon that does this kind of thing. This ain't nothing we're familiar with. This is something very strange. 
In order to be mistaken for UFOs, these natural Earth-like plasmas would have to display some extraordinary capabilities, like those witnessed in 1980 at Bentwaters Air Base, or in 1967 near the Canadian town of Shag Harbor. Well, some of them can sit on the water and have been observed going underneath water as well. Some just come out of the ground, that's where they come from initially, and some of them will just sit there, or some will flash off over the hill and come down again, earth themselves again. According to its proponents, the Earth-like phenomenon is the best and the only explanation for UFOs. I think if we understand earth light and the, all the range of phenomena associated with them, uh, quantum physics and, um, and plasma physics will literally take a quantum leap. They will literally move ahead a decade, probably one, one fell swoop. Still, UFO researchers point out what they see as a fatal flaw in the plasma earth light theory. We have to look at the characteristics of the earthquake lights or the plasmas or ball lightning or any of these things. How do they move? What color are they? What size are they? These are important considerations. Then look at the same data for UFOs. Well, the typical even landed saucer is 10 to 30 feet in diameter. These plasma phenomena are literally this big. So it's the careful consideration of what are the characteristics. If you're trying to explain this with this, they have to match. Perhaps not surprisingly, the ongoing wave of Mexico City UFOs has been swept up in this controversy. Many of the mysterious lights appeared in the vicinity of the nearby volcano, Popocatapetl. It is a matter of record that the long dormant volcano suddenly became active, precisely at the time the sightings began. During a research trip to Mexico in August of 1999, Paul Devereaux visited the ancient city of Teotihuacan, some 50 miles from the volcano, and theorized about the connection. This place is very active and volatile in a tectonic fashion. And what we found that these, these earth lights do frequent areas where there are active uh, surface tectonic geological faults. And this is a prime location for that phenomenon to occur and I think is one of the elements bound up into the whole Mexican UFO wave. The questions of whether UFOs are real or if life exists elsewhere in the universe may not be resolved by earthbound debate. There is, however, another approach. Build a rocket, blast off, and see for ourselves. Ancient civilizations who weren't yet blessed by the invention of electricity enjoyed at least one compensation. Their pristine night sky sparkled with a million stars. Early astronomers soon noticed that a handful of heavenly bodies traveled freely in the sky, unbound by the star's slow, methodical rotation. The Greeks called them planets, a word meaning wanderer. In modern times, when Earthlings began to ponder the question of UFOs and alien civilization, it was the planet Mars that became the focus of attention. If there truly were flying saucers, it was thought they would come from the mysterious red planet. In part, this belief stemmed from observations made by astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli in 1877. He claimed that Mars was laced with channels, canali in Italian, that linked the planet's polar ice caps. Schiaparelli's canali became known as canals, and some said they were not simply natural waterways. An American astronomer named Lowell thought that these were canals that were artificially created by an alien civilization and he began studying Mars extensively and writing books about the civilization on Mars that created these structures and so a lot of people began thinking then about how you would communicate with the Martians. 
The widespread public belief that Martians were real became clear when 32 million people gathered around their radios in October of 1938. We interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At least 40 people, including six state troopers, lie dead. Millions believed that the H.G. Wells radio drama, War of the Worlds, was a real report of a Martian invasion. The result was widespread panic. The director, Orson Welles, was unaware that his production would strike a nerve. I'm, of course, surprised that the H.G. Wells classic, which is the original for many fantasies about invasions by mythical monsters from the planet Mars had such an immediate and profound effect upon radio listeners. While the public was captivated by stories about Mars, a lone American pioneer named Robert Goddard was experimenting with ways of actually getting there. Goddard had come up with uh, ingenious designs for getting rockets from the surface of the Earth up into the high atmosphere, but this was widely regarded as a bunch of uh, silly nonsense by American scientists. However, in Germany, he had some fans, people like Werner von Braun, who were reading his research, and they then were inspired to implement his designs and improve upon them in Germany, and this led during World War II to the development of the V-2 rocket, which is the predecessor for basically the, the American and Russian space programs. With the launch of America's Viking space probe in June of 1975, the age-old dream of exploring Mars finally became a reality. A vehicle known as a lander actually touched down on the surface of Mars July 20th, 1976. The Viking mission showed that the surface of Mars is pockmarked with craters, like those on Earth's moon. There were also some indications that life may have existed on Mars in distant times. My personal feeling is that yes, Mars had a very uh, uh, substantial atmosphere early on with a lot of liquid water on the surface, and uh, perhaps enough to form these, these river channels and river valleys that we see that are quite ancient, that are perhaps older than three billion years old. So the issue of the ancient climate of Mars is, is an important one for the issue of whether life could evolve. Um, I think you can start to persuade yourself that the possibility uh, of life could be uh, somewhat reasonable, actually, and uh, particularly if you accept the postulate that if life can exist, it will exist. The life on Mars debate heated up again with the release of this picture, taken by Viking on July 25, 1976. It appears to show a giant monument, a mile-long structure that resembles a human head. It became known as the face on Mars. NASA has no official position on whether the face is a natural feature or a colossal sculpture. Still, those who worked on the Viking mission have been accused of hiding the discovery of a Martian civilization. I can't think of a group that would have publicized that possibility or that, that discovery more than those of us who were looking at the pictures. We were looking for stuff like that. Our careers would have been made. We would have loved to have trumpeted to the world that we found evidence of an ancient Martian civilization. Who the heck wouldn't? And after somebody pointed that out, those of us on the lander team looked at one of the boulders on the surface nearby the lander and we decided we could see the initials of every team member in the boulder that was about 10 feet away from the lander. NASA is currently building vehicles that will orbit and land on Mars in the next decade in preparation for a daring attempt to send astronauts to the planet in 2018. But recent discoveries have allowed scientists to study Mars right here at home. During the 1980s and 90s, NASA plucked a dozen meteorites from the icy expanse of Antarctica and then made the remarkable announcement that they were nothing less than small fragments of the planet Mars. You might reasonably wonder, how do we know that a particular rock that we find on the Earth is from Mars? And the reason is we've been to Mars with the Viking landers, so we have actual measurements of the chemical composition of the Martian atmosphere, and we find that in these dozen rocks that 
there are the chemical signature of the atmosphere of Mars is not quite like Earth air. It's just like Martian air, and that's how we know they really are from Mars. Scientists believe the rocks were blasted off Mars 16 million years ago when an asteroid collided with the planet. The meteorites made their way here, finally landing on Earth about 13,000 years later. After gathering and analyzing these otherworldly stones, researchers released some astonishing results. One of those rocks was the Martian meteorite that some scientists claimed had evidence of Martian microbes on it. This has been greatly debated among scientists, and I would say today the consensus is moving in the direction of skepticism. That is, most scientists who've looked at the question think that the little objects that are seen under the microscope are probably not from living things that were produced by some non-biological process. But there are still a few scientists who find evidence in the chemistry and in the structure that maybe these were microbes after all. So it's, it's still an open question. And the important thing out of all of this is not so much whether these, are, these particular meteorites have actual biological material in them, but it's opened people's minds to at least accept the possibility that this may be something that could occur and has opened this area for legitimate study. Jupiter's frozen moon, Europa, may also be able to support life. In 1996, images transmitted by the spacecraft Galileo showed that Europa has an ocean containing more water than all of the Earth's oceans combined. And according to scientists, where there is water, there can be life. There could be volcanic activity down uh, under, under uh, a liquid water ocean, and it's possible even that that volcanic activity is helping to keep that liquid water layer there. If that's true, then you can start to think about um, uh, biological systems that relate to the kinds of systems we have on the Earth. It's all highly speculative, of course, and, but it's the kind of thing that, that, that drives us as scientists to want to know more about a place like Europa. Ultimately, these interplanetary missions bolster the theory that life is not unique to Earth, a fundamental assumption if UFOs are to be taken seriously. I think it strengthens the hand of the people who believe that life is fairly commonplace within the galaxy and within the universe. Because now we don't have just one example, we've got two or more examples nearby. So that's why this becomes of profound importance, perhaps one of the most profoundly important things that, that, that man has ever done. Despite the promise of discovering life in distant galaxies, current rocket technology may put the brakes on expeditions into deep space. It would simply take too long to get there. The Voyager 2 spacecraft was the fastest vehicle ever built by humans, but it still took nine years to reach the planet Uranus, merely halfway to the edge of the solar system. To reach stars where life-supporting planets might be found, even Voyager would require a journey of 100,000 years. In the face of such daunting realities, science has come up with another way of reaching out to alien civilizations. Aim a hypersensitive radio antenna to the heavens and hope to strike up a long-distance conversation. It was in 1896 that an Italian engineer named Guglielmo Marconi hooked up some electrical parts in an inspired combination. Then he sent a signal roughly one mile, not over wires, but directly through thin air. Marconi refined his invention, and in 1901, he sent the first radio broadcast across the Atlantic Ocean. A message that would have taken Christopher Columbus several months to deliver could now be sent in the blink of an eye. Within a few decades, radio had taken its place at the center of modern life. Sports, politics, entertainment and commerce were revolutionized by the ability of sound and music to travel magically through the air. People began listening for Martians. They began to wonder, is there a Martian civilization that might be signaling to us? People like Marconi listened for these, and they occasionally announced that they had discovered signals from Mars. We now think that that was probably wrong 
because there was a type of signal that they were probably picking up that they didn't know about then, but we now understand. This is a strange kind of signal called a whistler. It's produced by lightning, but it's lightning that's been transformed by the Earth's atmosphere into a strange signal that sounds just like a whistle. Like that. And so you get what sounds like an artificial signal, but it isn't. The intergalactic eavesdropping continues today, but with far more powerful receivers. These are radio telescopes pointed toward the heavens in a search for faint signals from outer space. Some physicists believe they may well hold our best chance of contact with intelligent beings from other planets. At Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Earth's most sophisticated detector in the search for life in outer space is being updated in a laboratory. It will look for answers to one of humanity's oldest questions. Is anybody out there? The project is headed by Dr. Paul Horowitz. First and foremost, for a signal generated by an intelligent species somewhere else, we have to guess what kind of signal that might be. First of all, is it, is it light? Is it radio waves? Is it particles? Best guess is it's radio waves. Best guess amongst the radio wave possibilities are microwaves. What kind of signal there? It's anyone's guess. Some people believe a carrier, a single long transmission, a transmitter left on, probably saying nothing, just saying I'm here. Of course, radio has been around for over a hundred years. But only in the last decade have computers become powerful enough for SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Specialized chips and circuit boards comprise the brain of the radio telescope system. It will process the stream of signals captured by a giant antenna. Our search uses an 84-foot steerable radio telescope. Looks like a backyard satellite dish, but much bigger. It can collect rather weak signals and concentrate them at the focus. There we have some very sensitive amplifiers, the best that can be made these days, to strengthen that very weak signal. The tiny signals will be transmitted through cables into the control room where an array of computers will sort through the cosmic noise, looking for a deliberate signal, a sign of intelligent life. Occasionally we find strange signals there, really interesting signals that look like the kind of thing that might be produced artificially by another civilization. But if you got a repeat of the signal at the same frequency and the same point in the sky, that would tell you it was not a random event on the surface of the Earth or inside of your computer we would have to say that it's most likely being produced by another civilization some distance away. The problem is none of these signals has ever repeated, but it's enough to keep us intrigued and wanting to continue. But what are the odds that we will get a signal from some exotic civilization? That there's other life in the universe, guaranteed. That there's other life in the galaxy, guaranteed. Any odds you like, absolutely cannot be any other way. That there's advanced life somewhere in the universe, guaranteed. Somewhere else in the galaxy, so extremely probable that I would give you at least 100 to 1 odds that interstellar communication could well be taking place. Even with these unbeatable odds, the quest for radio contact faces at least one possibly insurmountable obstacle. A lot of people, both scientists and people who are critical of SETI, have said maybe an advanced civilization would use some equipment that's far beyond anything we could possibly know about and so SETI isn't even worth doing. And that's possible. It could be that there's some technique for communicating across the distances between stars that we have no conception of and we will not be able to do for a thousand years. But they probably thought about this too. And they probably went into their museum and they said, what did we use a million years ago in the primitive part of our civilization to communicate across distances? And they said, oh, there's this thing they used to call radio. And that's what we could use if we wanted to communicate with a primitive civilization that doesn't know the advanced stuff that we know. So I'm hoping that they're using the galactic equivalent of Boy Scout technology to send a signal that a civilization as primitive as we are could detect. If such a scenario plays out, we may be able to achieve distant rather than close encounters with extraterrestrial beings. Dr. Horowitz believes that one day, SETI will indeed receive a message from other intelligent life in the universe. And this will be quite an event. This will be the first bridge across four billion years of independent 
life start in evolution. It'll be the end of Earth's cultural isolation in a galaxy and a universe containing surely millions of other civilizations. It will be without doubt the greatest discovery in the history of humankind. Until that broadcast is received, we remain the eyes and ears of the universe, ever alert for a tiny signal that tells us we are not alone. However, during the 1980s, some UFO researchers came to believe that there were abundant signs right here on Earth that visitors from outer space had made contact. The clues were the so-called crop circles, large and often intricate patterns carved into fields of grain across Britain. Crop circles uh, were connected to the UFO phenomena beginning in the early 80s, soon after they appeared in England, because people figured round marks on the ground, gee, they're like UFO traces that UFOs have left before, so why not UFOs causing these things? Because they are mysterious, they can't seem to find the source of them. These mysterious forms began to appear in Bratton, Wiltshire, England, around 1980. Farmers here called the simple shapes corn circles and wrote them off as a quirk of nature. But the months and years that followed brought an explosion of new sightings. Crop Circle magazines soon emerged to publicize the elaborate and beautiful patterns that were now visiting other crops. Researchers who call themselves seriologists stepped in to catalog these strange patterns and discover common traits. But are crop circles evidence of alien visitors? To solve the mystery, a commercial film company in England undertook a nighttime stakeout of a cornfield in Wiltshire in 1991. It was here that filmmakers made a startling discovery. Thermal imaging equipment revealed the faint outline of humanoid shapes moving in a circle. But the shapes were in fact quite human. They belonged to a pair of Englishmen named Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley. Doug and Dave claimed responsibility for dozens of the complex patterns that had caused so much mystery. Many circles, the twosome pointed out, were even signed with their initials, D and D. The circles that we created in 1978 with the standing walls of corn as if they'd been cut out of pastry with a knife, they were our doing and we started it by, way back in that time. However, numerous crop circles have now been observed in Canada and the United States, in addition to those that continue to appear all across England. And Doug and Dave didn't make they would have to have been lickety split all over the planet. Having said that, uh, that doesn't mean I find a UFO connection. There really aren't any good cases of people seeing the saucer making the crop circle. It's another one of these interesting anomalies that should be studied at the university level and isn't being. Even without crop circles, most UFO researchers believe that unexplained photos and irrefutable eyewitness testimony make the case that UFOs are real and visiting Earth with alarming regularity. Virtually all of us have heard of UFOs, but relatively few of us have ever seen one. How are we to pass judgment on the question of whether or not they are real? Making such a decision is like being a juror and weighing evidence on one of the most important issues facing humanity. Perhaps UFOs are nothing more than hoaxes or mistaken observations. But if they are real, they have to come from some place. The universe offers infinite possibilities. If there is life out there, it may well have gotten going long before we did. Indeed, Zeta Reticuli, a pair of stars often mentioned as having planets that might support life, is known to be about one billion years older than the Earth. The thing we need to keep in perspective, we've only had fancy technology, call it a hundred years. Well, the Zeta Reticulans got a billion year head start. Let's be conservative. Let's suppose they only got a million year head start. Let's be truly conservative and say they only got a 10,000 year head start, which is nothing out of the billion years available.
surely we would all agree that we can't even imagine the advanced technology they have. If some advanced civilization built spacecraft that can actually whisk them through the universe, why would they want to visit a primitive galactic backwater like Earth? One can only postulate that they're concerned about their own survival and security. At the end of World War II, there were three signs visible to any alien visitor that soon this primitive society whose major activity is tribal warfare would be bothering them. Rockets, radar, and nuclear weapons were three signs that Earthlings might soon be a force to contend with in the interstellar neighborhood. If there are other civilizations in the universe, perhaps they felt the need to keep a watchful eye on potentially threatening developments here on Earth. There had been many, many sightings over air bases in, in the West, over classified atomic installations. They were not just randomly distributed, but they did seem to concentrate, at least in the early years, on places where experimental research was being done, this kind of thing. Statistically, astronomers know that there's life out there somewhere, and the chances of it being intelligent life is debatable, but it's possible that somewhere in the universe there are creatures like us. Now, whether they're coming here is a very tricky question, because we don't have the physical evidence. We don't have the chunk of saucer in our hand, and abductees haven't brought back a towel from the Zeta Reticuli Hilton. We don't have any of the good stuff that definitely proves that somebody has been here. What the UFO case lacks in physical evidence, it makes up for in solid eyewitnesses. The Air Force UFO investigations from 1948 to 1969 catalogued some 12,000 sightings. Most were explained, but 700 accounts from credible witnesses remain a mystery, despite all the Air Force efforts to explain them. They used all kinds of tricks to misrepresent what the results were, always focusing on only 700 couldn't be explained. Only? If I was looking for cures for cancer and I looked at 12,000 chemicals, would I say there is no cure because only 700 worked? The point is to find one. But even accounts from seemingly unimpeachable eyewitnesses are not enough, at least when the subject is UFOs. When you get down to it, what we have always is a story. I saw something. I saw a light in the sky. I saw a crashed flying saucer. And a story is mythology. It is not in and of itself proof. Yet videos and photographs add powerful support to eyewitness accounts of UFOs. Many photos have been examined by experts who have found no evidence of fraud or alteration. However, if it can be proved beyond a reasonable doubt that UFOs are real, we have only unleashed a new problem. The UFO phenomenon is a great challenge to our intellect, but even more it's a challenge to our humility. That mankind likes to think he's in control. And if we take this subject seriously, we realize we're not. But I believe that mankind, across cultures, is fundamentally in psychological denial on this subject. We don't know how to cope with it emotionally. We can't even begin to grasp it intellectually. Perhaps UFOs will one day be revealed as top-secret fighter planes, more advanced and alien-looking than the F-117. Or UFOs may prove to be nothing more exotic than birds or weather balloons, as laughable as our ancestors' belief in witches and sea serpents. Of course, it is entirely possible that UFOs are exactly what they seem to be alien aircraft from parts unknown. For the time being, at least, the truth about UFOs is in the eye of the beholder.
Josh is heading for the glacial ranges of Patagonia to examine the remains of a vanished tribe of giants and to attempt to solve one of the greatest riddles of our time. The word Patagonia itself means big feet. Who knew? The Giants of Patagonia on Digging for the Truth, tonight at 9 on the History Channel. That's huge.